It's October the 20th, 2022, and this is Curiously Polar. Look who's back from the high seas. Hey, <laughs> how's it going, Henry? <laughs> Fantastic. Hey, how are you doing? <laughs> doing wonderful. So, let's see. We had a bit of a yeah summer break, and um, and you just returned for how long? Uh, barely three weeks. So three one weeks week already <laughs> gone. So two more. So we we're, we're trying to get a couple of recordings under our belt here. Um, yeah, that's that's what happens when you have uh, people who, who who prefer to spend their time on sea. <laughs> Indeed, unfortunately. <laughs> so, um, tell us where have you been? Oh, I've been um, yeah up in the Arctic. I had a, the great luck to be expedition leader on the last north pole trip of this season um like like actually to the actual north yeah pole? to the actual north pole like yeah. not not just within a hundred miles or something i know at yeah, actually the north yeah. pole so we have two gps um or we have more but we have two uh, digital gps's on board which are relevant one is for for the actors for the electronic um sea charts mm -hmm. and the other one is for the helicopter emergency um or well, safety uh, system and that helicopter system that's also broadcasted into uh, the guests cabins and public spaces and the um the transponders for both gps's are on different uh, locations on the ship so the actors one was on 90 degrees zero 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 while the helicopter was still on 89 somewhere <laughs> <laughs> Is that so, precise? Wow. Yeah, so so the guests were just like, oh, no, you faked it. You're like, no, actually, with one sensor, we've been there, but the ship is a slightly larger Part thing. of the ship has been there. You know you know when, when sometimes between two countries you have a line on the ground and you can hop back and forth and <laughs> yes, exactly. you can do the same on the ship if, if you know exactly where it is. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's even so uh, wait, more wait, difficult wait, when you're wait. in the ice. You, you yeah. were, the North Pole is in the, in the sea ice. How exactly, and on <laughs> earth did you get there? Uh, with a wonderful ship, which is like the the only um, purpose-built expedition um, icebreaker. So it's Ponance uh, Le Commandeur Charcot, um, which is a PC2 uh, icebreaker, it's the second highest uh, class possible on this planet. And it's a higher ice class than most Coast Guard icebreakers in Canada and the US, um, Svalbard, pretty much everywhere around the world. And the only ships that are more powerful and have a PC-1 are actually the nuclear icebreakers um, of Russia. And due to obvious reason, they are a little bit out of business this year. So we've been, uh, I wouldn't say the only one, we've seen um, 50 years of victory on the North Pole once in the very <coughs> beginning of the uh, North Pole season. Um, but... Other than that, we've been the only one with uh, tourists from non-Russian countries. So, 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 so the ship. I forgive me if I can't pronounce the name. Um, Shako. <laughs> Le Shako, um is is a a guest expedition ship. So you have guests on board, and yes. it's it has a it has a an ice rating and can break ice. It's an icebreaker. It's it's an icebreaker. So it, it's classified as a heavy icebreaker by the shipyard. Um, the, the hull has been built in Tulcha in Romania. The engines have been outfitted in France and then the whole body including the engines has been towed all the way to Norway to Skovik where um, the outfitting hat, uh, has um, happened. Outfitting and is like putting cabins in and... Uh, the whole electricity, the, the whole system, everything. Um, later on the cabins, the, the whole um, galley, everything. Um, so it was basically just the hull that went from Romania, an empty hull that went from Romania to uh, Tulcha, uh, uh -huh. to uh, Shovik, and there it just got um, filled with everything the ship needs. Um, it's a huge, a humongous piece of equipment. It's uh, very large for having only 200 guests on board. Um, it's classified as a hybrid icebreaker because we actually have marine um, diesel oil and LNG on board. So the ship has the capabilities to run exclusively on LNG. And we also have batteries. However, we're not running on batteries for propulsion. The batteries are, um, in fact on board to actually um, balance out the huge amount of power you need to actually um, break ice because we have two uh, azipot um, propellers 
and each Azipot has a 17 megawatt uh, on power. <laughs> and when you <laughs> regularly, <laughs> when you regularly um, just steam with like uh, 14 knots, then you, you use about four or five megawatts max. Uh, when you go through the um, first year eyes, then you have around like maybe nine, 10 megawatts. But when you have actually thick uh, sea ice as we had in East Green at the beginning of the season, then mm -hmm. you're fairly quickly at 16 um, to 17 megawatts. Wow. And to balance that out and not to um, cause um, a power shortage on board, you need the batteries as a buffer in between. Uh, so when you have a, a sudden um, spike in consumption, then you need to serve it from somewhere because the generators can't just be um, plugged in immediately uh, when the when the need is there from the uh, generator uh, from the ASI pods, so that's why the batteries are there. So the batteries help to keep the lights on for everyone. A, a lot, <laughs> yeah. So that, do you uh, see the light flicker a bit? And no, but no? we have the displays on the bridge where you actually. So the the chief engineer in those situations is uh, preferably on the bridge and not in one of the two engine rooms. Right. Um, and there he has all the controls, and on the controls you actually can see the, the consumption, the production. You can see where it comes from and how much is still in the batteries. Mm. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. It's a really great tool um, we have there. So you went through the ice? You, did you? Did, yeah. uh, how much ice did you break? Uh, plenty. <laughs> <laughs> the thickest we had uh, was um, in the beginning of the season in May in East Greenland where we actually didn't manage to uh, fulfill a single of our planned itineraries. So because the, of the ice? Yeah. So the people in the office um, have just taken um, late summer um, regular expedition itineraries and just put them early in the year, um, starting in end of April, beginning of May. And the sea ice we face in East Greenland at that time of the year is just polar ice coming down the Denmark Strait um, with the East Greenland current. And... That is actually multi-year ice coming all the way from the North Pole. Okay, so that is thicker, uh, um, tougher ice. And I, I mean, we have to make this very clear. Uh, up there, out there, it's not like you can plan like like the photo trip I took to Romania in summer where you book a hotel and uh, know exactly <laughs> how long you will take from A to B and you have a, you have a GPS on board that tells you where to avoid a, a traffic jam and stuff. That's not like that it is a, no. a lot of day-to-day -day planning based Absolutely. on the actual uh, on the actual conditions that you face yeah and i started to say um this this season on on, uh, on Chaco that it's a little bit like being thrown back into the beginning of the uh, expedition <laughs> industry you can you, you can you you will the guests will uh, book an itinerary but the itinerary has a big disclaimer under it that says expect yeah. it or we hope to be able to do this exactly. don't don't nail us don't nail us down on it it's probably going to change it hasn't been that clear for most guests so if guests in beginning Did of you may get complaints? yeah yeah absolutely um really? in the beginning of may in the first uh first one two trips we had people who have booked particularly because of ile de france was mentioned um in the description in the itinerary sure and just to put that on um on your head um the the start of the trip was in the southern region around Tassilac, Am uh, Amasalik Fjord, mm -hmm. and uh, Ile de France is in northeast Greenland. Um, that's far far beyond uh, the charts. It would have been already a challenge to reach it without ice when you just have to steam because it's a lot of sea ice. It's a huge distance you have to cover. Mm -hmm. With the ice, it was just impossible to reach it in any um, reasonable amount of time. And then it's difficult to explain to guests because they are just um, coming when we cancel um, a certain destination or spot, just saying uh, because of the ice conditions we can't go there. Then they think, but I booked with an icebreaker. Why can't you go there? It's like, of course we can go. Technically we can go. That's not a point. But it will be very uncomfortable because but when you do break, you do you want to sp spend five days in choppy ice breaking conditions it, because exactly. it's not going to be fun? Yeah, the icebreaker itself behaves much much calmer than any other ship I've ever been on. Um, even going through the ice is smooth like butter most of the time. Do you hear and that? Do you feel it? 
you do feel it, yes. And when you have really strong, thick ice and we have to go back and forth and you have vibrations in the ship, and that makes it uh, slightly uncomfortable. That's really something yeah. that most people just say when we... We had a situation where we um, started a, a ramming procedure where we go in full speed. Back oh, so up, you should, should and, back up a bit and then try, yes, try and harder. Then just yeah. full speed again. And we had 17 rammings within a period of six hours mm -hmm. to, to just proceed one mile further. And we barely made that, that one mile. Um, and that's really uncomfortable. So that was just to showcase to the guests. Of course, we can make it. Um, technically, the ship is capable of breaking 15 meter thick pressure ridges. That's not the problem. The problem really is you burn tremendous amount of fuel there. You spend a significant amount of time and it's very uncomfortable. The whole interior is not built for those kind of vibrations because it inside it's a five star luxury hotel and the whole interior is not as flexible as the hull is. So that makes it a bit difficult to um, take the ship to its um, yeah, furthest capabilities. So we have to make plannings there. And that's where I sat with... Um, it's a little bit like a throwback to the beginning of the, season, of the, of the industry mm -hmm. where you didn't really know where to go. You were just um, looking on a day-to-day -day base on the map and just say, okay, let's stop here, let's go there. And that, that's pretty much what we do with um, Chacot. Yes, we have a, a general outline, a general itinerary, but it's very much dependent on ice conditions. It's very much dependent um, on weather conditions. The construction of the ship makes it um, necessary that when we commence uh, shore landings or Zodiac cruises, that we need to have a flat, calm sea because... The platform we have can't just really deal with swell. So we don't really have um, um, a fantastic aft marina like um, usually ships have these days. Um, at the same time, the ship is not built for shore landings. The ship is built to live in the ice, and it's made for that. And there it behaves perfectly. Ice landings from uh, from that ship, it's just, ah, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a dream come true, really. Is it is it fair to call it a landing if it's on ice? <laughs> yeah, that's why it's called ice landing. <laughs> or, is, or does okay, it have yeah, anything to do with Iceland? It's, no, it's just, just an kidding. icing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you spent uh, how long? A month? No, more than a month. Um, beginning of the season was almost two months, and the end was one yeah. and a half months. Uh, uh, again, so it was like three and a half, four months uh, all in uh, this okay. summer. Okay. And East Greenland was uh, spectacular. The North Pole was kind of a uh, thing I had to take for the um, for the second uh, following trip, mm. and that was actually what I yeah was looking forward the most all season. That was going through the Northwest Passage once more. Um, this time on a route that usually no other ship could have taken, and because um, of the the ice conditions. Yeah, exactly. So right. usually the northern route of the Northwest Passage would just be blocked with um, with ice. And when we started looking at it a month before the, the trip started, I was just writing an email to the captain just saying, um, do you see the same I'm seeing? Like, I'm not sure if it's necessary to take the ship all the way up there because there's literally no eyes left. So oh, really? It, yeah. So for us, the Northwest Passage was the search for the ice. And uh, oh. we steamed as fast as possible through... Um, the major part of the Northwest Passage to be able to spend a few days in the ice in the Bering Sea. Um, That's interesting. Above Fort Sea, actually. Is that it different was, different from other years? Yeah, yeah, very much. Um, it's something we saw in the beginning of the season in April, May, when we when we've been to East Greenland, and we faced uh, sea ice conditions that haven't been recorded in the past seventeen years. So we had mm. very very strong, very thick multi year ice, uh, polar ice coming all the way down from the North Pole, and. Um, I was just saying to the captain, if we have that ice here now, then it's missing somewhere else. It's not coming just out of nowhere. And that's what we just saw later on, that um, at, in the Northwest Passage, it was lacking. The North Pole was lacking ice. We were having very thin um, first year, second year ice, but not really the thick multi-year ice you would expect and was supposed to be hmm. there. So going to the North Pole, we made a tremendous speed. We just made it in, in three, three and a half days all the way up from Longyearbyen, which is quite um, that a sounds, short amount of time. That sounds quick, yeah. Yeah, it's it's awfully quick. Um, so for us, it was really just we steamed up all the way. So steaming through 24-7 pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, but with that chip, you also can steaming, go on Steaming, there's no steam involved though. 
No, no, no. But yeah, you, we're Is not it? saying okay. So, so, so I do well. Let's <laughs> let's get the terms straight here. Um, I've heard sailing when there yeah. were no sails involved, and steaming when there's no <laughs> steam. Is there a, is there a neutral term for moving from A to B on water that is not steaming or sailing? Floating. Floating. Uh, <laughs> this doesn't, doesn't sound right. Okay, everyone who's listening, uh, let us know if you know a better term. Curiouslypolar.com. And on Twitter, of course. <laughs> we're, we're, we need your feedback. But with that chip and uh, with its engine power, you can just go through almost you know, first year ice with 10 knots, which is just not heard of before. So that mm -hmm. was really just something um, completely new to us. And that makes the tr travel time from Longyear Bean to the North Pole very, very quick. Mm -hmm. So um, we planned out of their experience for the first three North Pole trips to go there as fast as possible and then spend some time in East Greenland before heading uh, to, to Reykjavik and from Reykjavik to the Northwest Passage. And on the Northwest Passage, um, it's a three and a half week trip and I think almost three weeks we had no ice. And um, it took us all the way through the um, Queen Elizabeth Ar uh, Archipelago in the northwest of the Northwest Passage, which is like north of uh, Melville Sound, um, all the way into the Beaufort Sea uh, to actually meet ice. And then it started drifting into Melville Sound. And usually Melville Sound would be choked with ice. You wouldn't be able to go through um, there with a regular... Um, cruise ship or expedition cruise ship this year was no problem at all most of the of the september for example and we've been fairly late in the season we started beginning of september in reykjavik um so uh, we've been in in the uh, western northwest passage around mid end of september mm. and usually you would think sea ice starts forming and it starts forming but start starts forming is just so thin mm. that we had um, really moments where you have a very thin black layer of grease ice or or nihilus in front of you but it's not uh, thick enough to carry enough weight that we actually could embark on it it's interesting how ice forms i mean the, the my my most uh, my most memorable experience there is a few years ago when i <laughs> sailed on the norderlicht from uh, from tromsø up to longyearbyen um, which was not not a tourist trip, just helping out pretty much. And when we arrived in Longyearbyen, like the last three four hours, and by the way, sailing is the right term there because yeah. we use the sails. <laughs> um, the the last uh, few hours arriving into Longyearbyen was early in the morning. I mean, four four a.m., five a.m., something like that, and uh, it. The whole area was, first of all, covered in, in a blue light, which was amazingly beautiful. And second of all, we sailed through slush. Yes. It was it was a thick layer of slush, and, and, and the waves would be very, very, um, not choppy, very soft waves, just, yes, just swelling up and really down. Is. And... Um, and that with a with it a, sounds with a little a, bit like sugar. What you're describing, which I, is, I don't know uh, the exact. I'm not a snow person, ice person, so I don't know the terms. But it was like I would think probably like five centimeters of of slush on top, like pieces of ice, but like a yeah, like a slushy that yeah. you drink. So that was for me, for example, the most exciting part of that last um, lack of the trip. The Northwest Passage was really going through all stages of sea ice formation and right. you visibly can distinguish the different types of ice. So we actually just um, gathered all the guests uh, on deck nine in the observation lounge and just had a live interpretation, a live lecture. That was that one, That would be my next question. So you spend several days on sea, no ice. Um, what yeah. do you do to entertain the guests? Because I would expect a bit of boredom there or potential for boredom. Yeah, I mean, um, we have a specialty with that ship and um, that goes for all ships of Ponant and that is that Ponant operates bilingually. So we have mm -hmm. French as first language and English as a second language. They are a French or, company. Exactly. Um, or depending, um, sometimes you also have English as first language. But however, that means that if you have onboard program, you have to do it bilingually, meaning that one run is English, one run is French. But not at the same time. It's Exactly. 
That means if you have a lecture, you have to do the lecture twice, once in, in each language. And But that you don't speak a French, do you? No, I don't. So how do you do? Uh, someone else took the took that yeah, part have, then. Okay. We have then like my my assistant expedition leader um, was doing a terrific job in translating my briefings, for example. Um, most of the French people actually do understand English, and mm -hmm. um, when you gather them in the theater for a briefing and you do it in uh, in English, then um, most people laugh about the jokes on the English part, and then that's a good, uh, that's a good sign. Few, yeah, yeah, just very few in the French part, so that's okay. Um, We, it sounds like an awful lot of sea days, but it wasn't actually because we knew about the situation with the, uh, with the sea ice. Mm -hmm. So we planned a couple of shore landings. We, we planned uh, a couple of community visits in South Greenland. We went through Prince Christian Sound and made a landing in Apilatok, which is a beautiful little community just at the edge of Prince Christian Sound. In, um, to enter the Northwest Passage, we, we decided to take the southern route through Hudson Strait and uh, Fox Basin to actually cross the um, very famous Fury and Heckler Strait. So there we actually visited um, Cape Dorset, Kingate, um, also a community uh, on the southern Baffin Island. We had uh, a visit at Sex Harbour towards the end of the cruise on Southern Banks Island. So we tried to mix that a little bit. We had a couple of um, historical landing sites like Fort Ross and Beachy Island in the Northwest Passage. Beachy Island yeah, just being the core of the Northwest Passage, um, where you have literally all the expeditions um, visiting at once. So it's really throughout history, everyone has been there. Um, you have the graves of the Franklin Expedition and one from the... Uh, McClintock expedition um, you have the remains of Northumberland house and so on and so forth and then we were actually from there on looking for the sea ice and then it's really when you find ice which you can't land on then it's a day in the ice and that means we try to get the guests out on the heli deck we have on the front on the bow of the ship uh, a large heli deck um, we have underneath the Halitech a promenade deck, uh, which is a little bit more sheltered. It sounds and so on, fancy. <laughs> it's a fantastic, it's really a great tool. And up on deck nine, we have the observation deck um, in front of the lounge, which is also great because there you can just retreat into the observation lounge, warm yourself up with a hot drink and just go out again. We have um, big Swarovski monoculars uh, mounted onto the um, observation deck on deck nine, which is just an amazing tool as well. So, It's an it's an um, an onboard experience. It's really an exploration with the vessel, and just with going with that ship through the ice is an experience on its own. And I can't get enough of that. So very often you will just find me hanging on deck five over the railing and just looking down at the ice, recording the cracks, the sounds of it. And I'm sure we're going to have uh, an episode just on on sea ice. Um, oh, definitely, yeah. Uh, where we can play some of those sounds. For me, that's really just um, a humongous toy for uh, grown-ups. It's really a fantastic experience. And the sea days usually um, are calming down a little bit. People um, who are booking a trip on that ship also want to get pampered a little bit. So we have a spa on board with a beautiful uh, massage saloon. We have an indoor pool, an outdoor pool. It's as a lot around the actual ice breaking capabilities, and people want to use uh, facilitate those kind of things as well. So the sea days are not as boring as we would think. It's not really what you and I would do, but for most people who are booking on those ships, it's, it's not part really. Of it. It's not really what I could afford, to be honest. It's absolutely, here, <laughs> same here. So. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. So, but yeah, wow, yeah. Go ahead. Wow. <laughs> well, no, wow, wow. By the way, a little, a little, um, a little um, thing here. You, you talked about the Swarovski uh, monoculars. Um, just want to mention for those who don't know, because I didn't know until a few years ago. You know, when when someone said Swarovski, I thought it was only like these fake diamonds <laughs> that you stick on things and make them look expensive. And uh, no, Swarovski, the same company, Swarovski, is very well known for binoculars, monoculars, optical instruments. They Absolutely. That's where they, I think, even originally come from. So they, they know how to grind lenses and things. That's also it's an Austrian. It's an Austrian company. Yes. That's also they, how they, they know really how to grind these worldly. fancy looking, fancy looking stones. So, so um, they are among the best 
that you can absolutely get. So yes. if if you have birders um, around you, they would pro- most likely aim for Swarovskis. Um, if you have uh, someone who is yeah, very elaborate hunter. He would have an, yeah. a Swarovski scope on top. So they, it's they're p- delivering because amazing stuff. Really, it's it's what I find really interesting. Okay, this has taken us completely out of this topic. But as a photographer, um, I know lens makers: Canon, Nikon, um, um, Tokina, Sigma, right. uh, Folklander, and so on. And Swarovski would, I mean. It would be easy for them to make, oh, Leica, of course, make some of the best optics. I would think Swarovski, op- Swarovski optics for cameras would probably be up there with the best. And they I don't, so too, yeah. you cannot buy a lens, a Swarovski lens for your Canon SLR. Uh, no. it's, it's not available. So, um, but, but they do, they make optical instruments. So I wonder why they have never branched out into photography. But hey. Good, good point. Uh, we can just write a message to Swarovski and just see what they say. <laughs> hey, I'm a photographer. <laughs> make make a good lens. Well, they make good lenses, just not for cameras. Indeed. Anyway, yeah. so yeah. Oh, by the way, but while while you talk, you you brought a video that we can have a quick look at, just uh, because we can. Let me well, that's that's the map here um, in the video on on YouTube. Um, it's a map of the Northwest Passage. Yeah. So all the red. Um, is land masses and on the right hand side you see the northwest of Greenland uh, on top of that you have Ellesmere Island and um, oh that's the yeah, ice on, ice map that's the ice uh, yeah exactly it's an Why ice map ice? from the yeah. 30s of August uh, so we started in the beginning of September mm-hmm. um, uh, so that's a, a week beforehand and you see all the blue is open water and the white yeah. is the ice and you can see there's little to no ice left in the Northwest Passage just in that small tiny archipelago in the very, very north. And that is very little charted. So for a ship with a 10 meters draft as the Le Commandant Charcot, that's really a gamble to go in an area where you don't have any any soundings. Mm. Um, for us, that's really tricky and we rather not go there. We tend to play it safe and want to have at least some, some 40, 50 uh, meters below our keel. Um, with 10 meters draft and you have suddenly um, a shallow somewhere, that's not the nicest way to encounter. Yeah. Well, up there, this it's it's difficult to get a tow truck to come and pull you out or something. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so most you, of the tow trucks are actually less powerful than the ship itself. <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> this is this is what happens when you buy the biggest, fattest SUV and you go into <laughs> the wilderness. You get stuck where the tow truck cannot get to. That's your problem. Well, it, it, it brings us to uh, very uh, fantastic encounters. Like in the past Antarctic season, um, the ship was supporting the brand new icebreaker of the British Antarctic Survey, the uh, server right. um, David Attenborough uh, in Antarctica to um, deliver supplies to the Thwaites Glacier Coalition. Um, that was pretty awesome. Or on the North Pole, we were uh, supporting um, the Norwegian uh, Coast Guard icebreaker, Crown Prince Hakon, uh, on the way to the North Pole, because for them it would have just taken so much longer because they're just tells simply us, not as powerful. Tells you a bit about how uh, powerful that ship is. So, so um, you also brought some some video from board uh, the ship. Um, Absolutely, um, that's a it's a little teaser. So for for every voyage, um, we have um, an onboard photographer and a videographer on board, and they deliver outstanding jobs. And, and by, on, by the way, this is not a paid advertisement. We're not getting anything. No, this is just material no. that you brought to show here on the show. Uh, just because it's an incredible experience, um, yeah. and, and this video has been produced by by Emmeline Bar, um, our onboard videographer. She's doing a terrific job there. Really great. Um, we had uh, also a photographer on board, uh, Joan Marchi, who um, was delivering also fantastic photos. Here we have um, throat singing at wow. uh, Kingate, really live, uh, nice live performance. Then in Fury and Heckler Strait, we had some snow and some tiny little bits and pieces of, of sea ice, but not really men- uh, worth mentioning. Polar bears. Polar bears, plenty of polar bears. We had and seals, seals. We had belugas, plenty of belugas. Over there, you see on the, on the coast, um, the white backs of the belugas. Then, you also get a um, bit of an idea about how big the ship is. Yeah. This ship is humongous. We have here this tool, uh, the SIMS, the sea ice measurement system. We had twice polar bear moms nursing their cups next to the ship, which tells you also how peaceful the ship can be. Um, 
be perceived by the polar bears when you just set it in the ice and wait. It's really something I haven't seen before. Really fantastic. Then we had first ice forming um, in the northern northwest passage, and then it's really interesting to see how polar bears are testing that ice and how they actually um, walk on it. And yeah, here you can see how it's forming. You can see um, yeah polar bears uh, occupying it for the very first time, and uh, yeah, really getting curious about the ship getting closer. How how far and is it from from the deck to down to the ice? How it's safe about, are you? How safe are you? That's my main question. Uh, very safe. So <laughs> they would need to jump and they're too careful for that. And here you can see that's like all on the belly and just using the front Sliding, claws yeah. to yes, to slide, to, to just distribute the whole weight um, onto that very thin new ice. It's really incredible um, to see that behavior. Then we have this sun dog, beautiful sun yeah. formation, uh, beautiful rays. Um, a lot of moms with cups uh, around the ship which you just really can set into the ice and then you just wait what happens this big fat mama here uh, at the end uh, a very well nursed polar bear and that is a pretty pretty uh, amazing um, experience from this arctic season very rarely we have seen skinny um, or very very very, uh, very thin polar bears we've seen a lot of well nurtured bears a lot of very big ones particularly in East Greenland and in Arctic Canada. Um, that's just something, even throughout the high summer, where you usually would have skinny polar bears because the sea ice disappears, so uh, the feeding ground, hunting ground disappears. Um, throughout this Arctic season, that was for me the very first time that we've seen so many well-nurtured, well-fed polar bears. Really great to see. That sounds awesome. It's fantastic. We started actually in East Greenland, um, a citizen science project, a polar bear log, where we actually track every polar bear sighting we have, where we describe um, how the polar bear looks like, um, how the polar bear behaves, how the ship behaved, how the ice conditions were, and we make that available for our researchers, whoever's interested in, in, in this kind of data. Um, we started in East Greenland because there's very little to no um, information or data on polar bears in East Greenland. And we just continued it throughout the entire season, and we're certainly going to continue that next year. That is cool. That is for, so. So, do you do you involve the guests in that as well? So you get a yeah. We um, in in the evening recaps, we actually ask them about their um, assessment of the bear, what they would say, also to mm -hmm. make them uh, tr involve them in trying to figure out is it a male or female. Um, may them may them make them learn to observe well. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, because that's what it's you a, want to do. It's a very important part um, for me. That the ship is not only an icebreaker; it's not only um, getting guests out into those places, but Pono um, actually committed to a very amazing project, and that is understanding that that ship goes into areas where no one else is going, at times where no one else can go, and by that they actually implemented uh, a wet lab and a dry lab. So on every cruise, they have two to four resident scientists on board from Ooh. very well-known universities. We had uh, scientists from Alfred Wegener Institute, uh, from University of Marseille, all over the place, all over the world. They come on bringing their own um, projects and just collect data as much as possible. So we try to find a balance of uh, deploying the uh, scientific instruments or scient uh, scientific teams um, without interfering too much with um, the guest program. But, but then, often, but then you can also. I, I would expect the guests to be really curious about what's going absolutely. on. Absolutely, and, use and that that's as exactly a what's happening. Bonus. Yes, and exactly, and that's what what's happening. Particularly when you have projects that's related to sea ice, which most of the time is the case because it's an icebreaker. And when they set up on an ice landing um, parameter, when they set up their uh, science station to actually drill through the ice and get some samples or whatever then it's very, very well frequented by uh, by guests on the ice. And we usually need to have one, two people there who explain what the scientists are doing so the scientists can actually still continue doing their job because that's what they're there for. Um, scientists are not always the best at communicating what they do. <laughs> no, but also if you have people who are really good in communicating, um, you have to find the balance as well of communicating and right. still commencing your, your research. You you want to uh, assemble data there. You want to really get work, that stuff yeah. together. 
So that's why we need to find a better balance to have uh, a science communicator within the expedition team, which is uh, the link between the science team mm -hmm. and the expedition operations. So when when you do the the citizen science part of it, which is the ice bear, uh, the ice bear, polar bear, <laughs> we say ice bear in Germany, um, the polar bear counting and and documenting. Um, is that also informed by scientists? Like, uh, do you know from scientists what they need, what is interesting and important for them in terms of information? Yes, and that's what we actually uh, started in the beginning of the season in uh, early May. We actually um, started the conversation with uh, polar bear researchers and asked what would be helpful for you to gather data. Right. And they gave us some hints. Um, so we actually extended our observation to that regard. We have other um, citizen science projects like Happy Whale, for example, which you actually also can, can do um, on your own wherever you are. If you spot a whale, just take um, pictures of the dorsal fin or the fluke. Mm -hmm. And you can upload them to the database, happywhale.com, I think it is, um, where the algorithm, the AI behind it, just tries to identify that individual. And then it gives us a migration pattern. It gives us um, a, yeah, a, a motion um, route, basically, a roadmap of where the whale has been in the past years. And that is pretty awesome too. Recognizing uh, as in like face recognition? Well, it's not yeah. face, it's, it's fin recognition for whales yeah, absolutely. probably. So humpback whales, for example, have a very unique um, fluke. It's um, like a the fingerprint, pattern. right? Yes, exactly. So the, the the color pattern, but also the shape is a fingerprint. Yeah. Um, very similar with the dorsal fin of um, of orcas, the the saddle patch of the orca as well, the eye patch of the orca. All of those um, data points come together, and the the better your picture is. The, the easier it is for the software to identify individuals. And hey, can, that's Henry. Exactly. Or Charlie, Bill. In, in, in Alaska or in Vancouver, <laughs> British Columbia, it's um, it, it actually really goes uh, to to identify local uh, specimen, like I individuals see. which yeah. are coming uh, back over and over again, and very similar in Antarctica. Uh, we have a couple of, of whales which we've now seen uh, over and over again. We have an orca in... Um, in Antarctica, which has like a yeah, like a zigzag line in his uh, dorsal fin, a male, and we've seen it now, I think, three years in a row. Um, awesome. So that's that's just really something that makes you makes you really excited about making friends with a whale. Yeah, look at that. There are a couple of more citizen science projects like eBird for birders or uh, cloud recognition for NASA. So there's really a lot uh, what you can do. Uh, you can help identify the amount of phytoplankton in the water through such a disk and so on and so forth. It's really um, a great um, involvement for guests to give them a little bit the feel of they're not there just for the pleasure, but also help to, to gather data. And it's very, very important for scientists um, that rarely can afford to go down or up to those uh, remote polar regions to actually get their data sets together. All right. I think that's a good spot to conclude this episode. Um, you are here for another few weeks, so we will try to to cram in a few recordings so um, that we at least cover some of the next months with it. Um, yeah, we are going to be, uh, of course, online at Curiously Polar on Twitter and at CuriouslyPolar.com. On the web, we have... We have uh, how many episodes? Oh, 160, 160 other episodes yes. online. This is 161. And um, of course, we'd love to hear from you. Tell us what, what you're interested in. We will be back uh, in a week or two, maybe. Shortly. So until then, everyone, <laughs> take care. Bye-bye.